You ever been to a softball or a basketball baseball game? Duh. I remember when Jim, because Jim used to play professional baseball before I met him. He washed out, but he was a baseball player. I didn't mean that in a mean way, honey. I'm sorry. But look what God made you. How awesome. A pastor. How much better. But I remember when he took me to a baseball game for the first time, and I'm so not a jock. And we were at this baseball game in San Diego, and I kept going, why are we not hearing anything? Because I was listening, I was used to listening to the radio about all the calls. They don't say anything at baseball games. You have to figure it out for yourself. That's why people are at baseball games with radios and things in their ears, because they can understand what's going on then. So that was a stupid thing to say, so I don't know why I said it. But anyway, my name is Debbie Cobra, and Jim and I are founding pastors here, and we had the privilege of being able to see what God has done in the last 30 years. And so we're going to pray. I have a big word today, and Pastor Dan's been in the Philippines, and so when he was organizing things while he was gone, he said, will you take and preach on the kingdom of God because this is, the, this is one of the foundation scriptures. And I said, yes, I will. But he didn't know I was going to teach from Genesis to Revelation. And I have about 40 minutes to do this. So let's stand. Let's get going. And then we're going to lock you in your seats and lock the doors. <laughs> Father, thank you for the body of Christ and for the saints. Thank you for the Rock Church, for the privilege that we've had of attending this church for so many years and seeing you work. Now, Lord, as we open your word, I ask that you to open our hearts. As we open our hearts, Lord, open our eyes and open our ears. And may we know the times and the seasons that we're living in. And may we grow up into the fullness of the stature of Jesus Christ. We bless the churches around us, Father, and the church worldwide. What a privilege to be a part of a magnificent family on the earth. Your body, your family, your temple. So bless now, Father, and help me, Holy Spirit to teach this in the way that you would want me to teach it. And I ask it in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen and amen. We are in the book of Colossians. And the book of Colossians is a magnificent book on the deity and the lordship of Jesus Christ. But also in this book is a verse that kind of hit me between the eyes. And Jim and I got married 40 years ago in Santa Barbara in 1979. And God brought two very screwed up people together. I was 28. He was 32. He was a little more screwed up than I was, but that's not really true. He was much more together than I was. Honey, I am picking on you. It's because I love you and it's fun. <sighs> I got to stop this because I got a lot to do. Anyway, long story short, here we are two messes. I was a bigger mess than he was. And God took us, washed us, cleansed us, got us together, married us. And he began to set us on a journey that we never dreamed would ever happen. Jim was a businessman and we never, we thought we were going to make money for the kingdom of God. We had no idea we would ever pastor. Ever, ever did we think we would pastor. But God had a different plan. But some things happened in our lives that changed our lives. We did some things. So as I'm speaking to you, as younger, probably most of you are younger than I am, and as I'm speaking to you out of experience, I want to tell you that this topic today I'm passionate about because I believe it's one of the topics. It's huge. It's enormous. It's from Genesis to Revelation, and I'm going to be speaking on the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are used interchangeably in the gospel. So when you see that word, kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God, it's speaking of the same. But it's the rule, it's the reign, and it's the realm and the regency of the king because you cannot have a kingdom without a king. And when I began to see the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven in my life and that God wanted me to live in it now and understand it, that he wanted me to grow up and he wanted me to understand some things, when that penny dropped, when that revelation began to shine its light into my heart from Genesis to Revelation, he started to connect the dots. And it is the most incredible plan and it is the most amazing reconciliation, restoration program that will ever be seen in all of eternity. And it pertains to you and I. We have a huge piece in this reconciliation, restoring project that God is in. So today we're going to look at that. And, and if you'll turn with me to Colossians, and let's look at our text scriptures this morning. Colossians chapter 1, Dan and, and Jim and mostly Pastor Dan 
has been in Colossians chapter 1, and it's describing the preeminence and the deity of Jesus Christ because nobody knew who he was. Is he man? Is he God? Who is he? Satan didn't know who he was. The Jewish people didn't know who he was. They missed their day of visitation. Who is Jesus? And as, as it says, there's a little saying as I teach kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God and angelology in the Bible college and Christology, there's a saying that says the old is in the new revealed, but the New Testament is in the old concealed. So the New Testament is in the Old Testament, but it was hidden. It was a mystery. There's over 350 prophecies of the coming Messiah. They have almost all been fulfilled except for his second coming. And statistically, that is a number larger than the earth can compute. It is an impossibility. If you wonder why we believe the word of God, it's because that which has been spoken and that which has been prophesied hundreds and millenniums ago has come to pass. Jesus Christ is who he says he is. And we didn't know who he was. And so as we've looked at this in Colossians, it says all things were made by him and for him and through him and without him. Nothing was made that was made. Hebrews teaches us he's the brightness of his glory. He's the express image of God. That when he by himself purged us of our sins, sat down at the right hand of majesty on high and holds all things together by the word of his power. Jesus, all God and all man. But this king, this magnificent king, Paul writes to the Ephesians and says there is the unsearchable riches of Christ. It was a mystery that was hidden in the ages. The prophets longed to see it, but now it's been revealed to us, the church. And so when this revelation becomes real to us and it, it, the penny drops, it actually changes our perspective. It changes our lives and things begin to happen that could never happen. So in Colossians chapter 1, verse 18 through 21, it says, And he's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. And in all things he may have preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the, full, all the fullness should dwell. The fullness of the Godhead bodily dwelt in Jesus Christ. He had God the Father, God the Holy Spirit. He was all God and he was all man, walking on this earth as he was born of a virgin. That's what they're saying. But this is what I want you to see. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him, by him to reconcile. Reconciliation, reconcile. You cannot reconcile that which is not torn apart. To reconcile means to bring back together. So when he talks about reconciliation, something was torn apart. So keep that in mind. Something was not together that should have been together that he, by him, to reconcile all things to himself. By him, speaking of Jesus, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of the cross. So God is reconciling things. And in Ephesians, the text that goes next to it, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. In Ephesians chapter 1, if you'll look with me at verse 9 and 10, having made known to us the mystery of his will. Again, this was hidden. It was concealed in the Old Testament through the prophets. But now it's revealed in the dispensation of grace and of Jesus Christ. This mystery that people long to see has now been revealed. That in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one, one. Say one. 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 All things in Christ. Some things, all things in Christ. Now watch this. Both which are in heaven and which are in the earth in him. Now that may not mean a lot to you, but let me just explain it. This kingdom that God is speaking of is his kingdom. He is God. Rahab had it right when she said, he alone is God in heaven and he alone is God in the earth. There is one God. There is one kingdom. God the creator, we didn't climb out of some ooze and slip into some evolutionary plan. You and I were made in the image of almighty God. But there was a fall, there was a, there was a death, there was a spiritual death that took place when the first Adam ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and he died spiritually and then he died physically because death is not a ceasing to exist. Death means separation. 
Therefore, God knew this, and before the foundation of the world, he had the plan of redemption that there would be a time, and he prophesied this in Genesis 3.15 to the serpent, and he said, there's one coming. Yes, you have bruised his heel, but there's one coming, born of the seed of the woman, that will crush your head, will annihilate your kingdom, and will take back the title deed of earth, because Satan at that point in time had usurped authority. So there's a kingdom. And there's a reconciliation program going on. And what is amazing to me that it's things in heaven and things on the earth. Now, what do I mean by that? You and I live in time, space, and we have something called material, corporeal, substance, time. You can't define it except by the clock. Go and look at it up on Wikipedia. Wikipedia knows everything. We all know that. That's the joke. Time. Einstein tried to describe time. He couldn't. So the best way to describe time for you and I is what's on the clock. God has ordained that you and I live in times and seasons. We have a beginning and we have an end, earth side. Would you agree with that? You're born and you're going to die. It's called time. It's on a linear basis. There is something called space, expanse. That's where we live. In this third dimension world, there's a universe, there are stars, there are planets, there are things, and then there's something called substance, which is made and can be measured, like it has a molecular constitution to it, and you can actually define it. Atoms and neutrons and electrons and subatomic particles. That's our science. That is our world. That is the universe that we live in. But there is a universe. There is a place that cannot be measured, that cannot be conceived of, that cannot be tasted or touched or seen or felt or heard, it is the spirit realm, it is where God who is spirit lives and who created all things, and we know that by him, that which is visible was created by that which is invisible, the kingdom of God. And when you and I come to the kingdom and we realize that there is a king, we are coming out of our natural element. And that which we live and we do and we taste and we hear and we feel and we speak and we touch all those senses that God gave us in these earth bodies. None of that can be discerned or can discern the kingdom of heaven because it is in a completely different place. And we know by faith that the kingdom of God, the, king, the kingdom, the word of God, by the word of God, the visible was made. So the invisible is before the visible. Are you with me? This is Christianity and this is humanity 101. So when God says he's reconciling all things back to himself, visible and invisible, this is a massive, massive program because he's talking about the spirit realm as well as the physical realm. He's talking about things you and I can't see or know of. And he's reconciling everything back to himself. He's bringing it back together because something happened that split it apart. Something happened that caused it to disengage. Something happened, and God knows exactly what he's doing. There is nothing more powerful than God, but God had a plan. And he knew that evil was going to come forth when he created Lucifer, and we'll look at that in a minute. But now the point is, this kingdom, he is reconciling all things visible and invisible back to himself through Jesus Christ and his cross. And that, beloved, means you and me. Because you're his body on the earth he doesn't disassociate from us. He's the head, we're the body. We're called the body of Christ, the temple of the Holy Spirit, the family of God. And God is saying, I need you to understand the kingdom and that you're in this world, but you're not of this world. So there are five things we've got to understand about this kingdom that we now live in and have our being in. Because most of us are still living in a world that is corporeal, where you see, touch, taste, feel, and hear. But there's a world beyond that that is more real than this one. And you and I have got to grow up and understand what this kingdom is about, who this king is, and how and what we do as we live out whatever earth years we have. Because I am speaking this morning to immortals. I'm speaking to those that are going to live forever. Governments don't live forever. Nations don't live forever. The earth will not live forever. It's... A, it's ordained for destruction. Heaven and earth will pass away, God says. 
but I'm speaking to beings made in the image of Almighty God who are immortals, and you're going to spend your immortality, your eternity, either in heaven or you will spend it by choice in hell. But God did not make us for hell. He made us for heaven. He made us subjects of the kingdom, but there's a way through and there's a way to, and that's what we're going to look at today. The kingdom. Five things we must know as believers. This is kingdom 101. This is, this is baby stuff. This is where we start. Number one, we have been transferred into the kingdom of God. That means we were somewhere else. And in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, it says, He has, past tense, delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed. That word conveyed means to transfer, to deposit, to take from one place and deposit into another and conveyed us into the kingdom, conveyed us from the power of darkness. So we were locked in that kingdom. The Bible teaches us that we were slaves in that kingdom, that Satan sees us as sheep for the slaughter and conveyed, deposited us into the kingdom of the son of his love. He is the king, Jesus Christ, and his kingdom is real, and it's being reconciled earth side and heaven side, and we have a big job to do earth side. Number two, we are citizens of this kingdom. You're not going to be, if you're born of the spirit of God, you've been deposited in, it is now a reality in your life, and you are now a full-fledged, bona fide, fully privileged child of God, citizen of the kingdom of heaven. That means you have direct access to the power, to the throne, to the king. And in Ephesians 2.19, it says, Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. You see, you're not just a citizen. You're a member of the household. You're a member of the family. You bear a name. You are family, and you happen to be family to the king. That means you can access the king. That means you can get to the king. That means you are beloved, and that means the king now wants to give you part of the family business, which is the kingdom. That's why Jesus said, fear not, little flock. It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It's the family business. But if I don't know it and I'm not growing up enough for it, I'm not going to live fully and completely how God wants me to live with full privilege and full asset and full right in the kingdom. So number one, you've been translated, transferred. Number two, you're citizens. Number three, we live in kingdom law. You see, the king has a kingdom and the kingdom has a rule of law. Now, this takes 16 weeks in the Bible college to teach. I'm giving you a structure. I'm giving you a frame. I'm giving you an outline. So this kingdom law is agape. It's love. God is love. Now, I'm not talking about a sloppy, kissy-faced, huggy bear kind of a love. I'm talking about the very essence of Almighty God, who he is, how he relates, his character, and his presence. He is agape. He is love. But there's another side to that love. You see, that's why God can't wink at sin, because what cost him so much because of love. On the other side of love, there is retribution. There is judgment, and there is an end coming to all evil. Evil, and we'll see that in a minute. God says you are now bona fide citizens of the kingdom of heaven. You have new natures. Your nature is love. And in James 2, 8, it says, if you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. So James names this as the royal law. All the law and the prophets, all the Old Testament, everything that God laid down can de be defined in agape. Because love does no harm to its neighbor. And in Matthew 23, when Jesus was asked, what is the greatest law of the kingdom? This is what he said. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, 
paying all the law and the prophets. God knowing that there was a kingdom they didn't understand that they were going to be deposited into through the birth and the new birth of Jesus Christ. That there would be a new nature in us, a nature of love. And this would be the royal law by which we live, we move, and we have our being in. When we begin to understand that agape, which says, your needs at my expense. My husband has defined it as personal self-sacrifice for God. So agape the world that he gave his only begotten son. Who can separate us from the love of God, which is found in Christ Jesus? God is love. And it says in the word in 1 John, John wrote it and he said, as he is in this world, so are we. We are bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. And the kingdom law is love. So number one, we've been transferred. Number two, we're citizens of the kingdom. Number three, we live in kingdom law and all can be wrapped up. Now there's all kinds of laws in the kingdom which we study in Bible college. The law of persistent faith, law of passionate prayer, law of accumulation, law of sowing and reaping. There are laws, there are things that we study because Jesus, it was a huge topic. He came to teach us the kingdom and show it to us. We couldn't imagine it. But the royal law fulfills it all. Number four, we operate in kingdom currency. Not only is there a law and a rule of law, but now there is an economic system in God's kingdom. That which moves goods and services can be defined as economics. What moves the invisible to the invisible? Most of you in the first three rows know this because I've taught this like an unbroken record. But it is faith. Now, faith is a substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things we do not see. It is our homeland. It is our country. It is the air we breathe. God operates through faith. Jesus said, have faith in God. Whosoever shall say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes those things that he says, shall have them. If you go to the Father, in my name, ask and you shall receive, because I go to the Father. Faith is a substance. It's tangible of the things you cannot see. Why? Because you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. When Jesus looked at 5,000 hungry men and women and children, and he looked at his disciples, and he's teaching them. It's a show-and-tell moment. And he says to them, after they bring him the problem of these people are hungry, it's been three days and they haven't eaten. He says, you feed them. And in John, it writes, and John says that he was testing them. Why? Because it was show-and-tell time. It was time to show the Father through him, and it was time to tell of the kingdom and reveal it through his acts. You see, the kingdom of heaven is around you. It's in you. It's, it's where you are now. And he took five loaves and two fish of bread, and he fed thousands and thousands of people. When he saw a withered arm in the temple, in the synagogue, he didn't see a withered arm. He saw a whole arm. When he saw the woman bent over 18 years with arthritis or whatever it is she had, and on the Sabbath, he said, be loosed from your infirmity. And she stood straight up after 18 years. He saw not her bent over. He saw her completely bound by demonic power and by sickness and disease that came as a result of the fall. But because he was the king and he was bringing the kingdom, he said, be loosed from your infirmity. And she stood straight up. When he saw the blind, he didn't see them unable to see. He did what he needed to do. He brought the miraculous healing of the kingdom of heaven, and he healed them. The blind saw, the deaf heard, the lame walked, the dead were raised. The kingdom of heaven is coming to you. The kingdom of heaven is coming to you. The kingdom of heaven has come into the body of Christ. So number one, you've been transferred. Number two, you're citizens. Number three, we live in the law of the kingdom, which is love. Number four, we operate in kingdom currency, which is faith. And number five, we execute kingdom authority. We are here not to just enjoy life, although all things have been given us richly to enjoy, but we are here to execute and to bring forth that which God has ordained. That's why Jesus said to Peter, when Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And Peter, because you're the church of the living God, the gates of hell will not prevail. A 
against my church. Therefore, what you bind in earth will be already bound in heaven. And I'm giving you keys to the kingdom. And what you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. You see, there's an enforcement policy that comes automatically with the saints. He's the head where the body he is not disassociated from us. Therefore, it is necessary that we understand this kingdom. We know our king, his unsearchable riches, and that we begin to invoke and know, number one, that we've been transferred. I'm in the kingdom now. I don't have to wait for death, for immortality. I'm already living an immortal life, and the kingdom is now. It's in me. It's around me. There's not a mansion in the heavens that I'm waiting for. I'm going to see that. But kingdom living starts the day you get born again and you're taken out of darkness and you're brought into the kingdom of God. Number two, you are citizens. There's nothing you can do to unravel that. You are adopted and you're citizens. Number three, you've got a new nature, agape. It's the law of the kingdom and it's the king himself. And you have his DNA. Number four. You operate in the economy, faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And those who come to him must believe that he is. He's God in heaven and he's God in the earth. And that he is a rewarder. He's a good God. He came to give us life and to give it abundantly. And a rewarder of those who will press in and diligently seek him. And not just a, a half-hearted life, but we will live a full-hearted life in the kingdom. Pressing into the kingdom. Praying passionately. Believing God for the miraculous. Confronting the demonic. And have a burning passion to see the lives of men and women, boys and girls, saved in every continent of this earth. Pressing in to this kingdom. So, having said that, am I yelling at you? I'm sorry. <laughs> Nana is screaming. I am so sorry. I need to smile more because I can look ferocious. <laughs> Five things you need to know. You've been translated, transferred. You are citizens. We live in kingdom law, which is agape love. It's where we live. We move in the economic system. Like we do in America, capitalism is our system here. We move in kingdom circumstance and systems. Peter said, silver and gold I don't have, but such as I have I give to you in the name of Jesus. Rise and walk. It's the currency. I don't have silver and gold, but I've got faith, and I've got the name of Jesus, and I'm believing for signs and wonders, and in his name, rise and walk. And we enforce kingdom authority. Jesus said, all authority has been given unto me. Go ye therefore into all the world. Because I have it, I'm delegating this authority to you as my people. So, this kingdom is magnificent. It's beyond description. And God is reconciling all things back to himself. But I have to tell you, original sin did not originate on the earth. And Jesus did not spill his blood. He spilled at earth's side, but he delivered that blood, that sacrifice, that payment, that ransom. He delivered it to the throne of God in heaven, in the third heaven. So sin didn't start here. He is reconciling. He's bringing together everything that's been ripped apart. So now I want to tell you about the opposition party and the opposition kingdom. Because when people say to you, if God is such a loving God, and if he's so good, how can he let these horrible things happen? How can somebody go to Las Vegas, rent a room, pull out an AK-47 or whatever he pulled out, and slaughter hundreds of people? God didn't do that. There is someone who did that. And there are demons. You see, that wasn't a man that you can figure out. That was a man infested with demons. But let's look at what happened. Isaiah chapter 14. Original sin originated in heaven. That's why the temple had to be cleansed. That is why Jesus brought his blood to the mercy seat in heaven. When Mary came to him, he said, don't touch me at the tomb. When he made a pit stop and saw Mary, he said, don't touch me. I've not yet ascended to my father. But go and tell my brothers that I have risen and I'll meet them. He was ascending. He was going. He was doing something. And in Isaiah chapter 14, and the companion scripture to that would be Ezekiel chapter 28, where it speaks to, first to a prince and then to a king. And the king that Ezekiel 28 is speaking to is not earthbound because he's walking in the stones of fire. 
and he's obviously some type of created being in the invisible realm. So this is what God says. He pulls the curtain back and he gives us a glimpse. And he says, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. His name was Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend unto heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit in the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north where God's throne is. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Sin originated with Lucifer. And Lucifer said, I will be like God, independent and apart from God. And it's called pride. And the definition, the biblical definition for pride is independent, selfish desires. Remember I said agape is personal self-sacrifice, your needs at my expense. Satan's power, his lust, self, is my needs at your expense. God says humility is the door into the kingdom. That is the door that opens up. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When you come as a humble, what is humility? Dependent on God. Childlike, dependent. You see, pride is independent, selfish desires. I will be like God apart from God. I will have what God has without God. I will exalt my throne. I will. I will. I will. And self becomes the very center of his universe. And that is exactly happened at the fall. When we ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we lost the God connection. And instead of God being the center of our lives, we died spiritually and self got on the throne. Independent, selfish desires. And now we decided for ourselves what was good and what was evil. That was the beginning. And we were born into this disease called sin that separated us from God. That's what death is, separation. And it took Adam a thousand years to die physically. His body went back to the dust. But you are spirit. God breathed his spirit into you. He gave you a personality and a soul. And you see, your spirit and your soul are immortal and eternal. And you are made in the image of God. And God said, I'm not going to leave them as slaves to the kingdom of darkness, as sheep for the slaughter, I have a plan. I'm going to send myself. I'm going to wrap myself in sinful flesh. I'm going to wrap myself as a human being. I will be all God, and I will be all man. I will walk through the human experience. I will be able to qualify to be the sacrifice. You see, he had to redeem us back because we were lost. He had to buy us back. Through identification, he had to become a man. Then he reconciled us back, brought us back to the Father with a new nature. And then he is restoring us back, giving us everything that was lost at Eden. We have the mind of Christ. We have the Holy Spirit. How is he doing this? He's doing this through transformation. That's why God says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you be, may be able to prove what is the good and the perfect will of God. Satan fell. God cast him out of heaven. Sin started there, and that's where the blood went. It was spilled on the earth as a man, but it was taken to the highest heaven where no man can go, only God. That is why he had to wrap himself in flesh and become the last Adam through identification, the kinsman redeemer. But when that kinsman redeemer climbed on that cross, and when he took death and hell on, and he went to hell for you and I, and he took the keys of death and hell, and he raised from the dead, and he led captivity captive, and he went to the mercy seat of God, and that blood was shed. You, once and for all, by believing in Jesus Christ, are forever cleansed. You are holy, and you are righteous, and you are pure citizens of the kingdom of God, members of the royal family. But Satan... Satan took his cohorts with him. We don't know how many. Revelation tells us a third. That's because it's using metaphorically a story of the dragon in the 12th chapter of Revelation. But Satan's rebellion, I'm talking about darkness, 
took angelic beings with him. Do I believe in angels? Absolutely. Do I believe in demons? Oh, absolutely. God said, cast out the demons. Get real. Quit looking at these foolish movies that they're making about zombies and vampires. Understand there's a real invisible realm. There is an enemy. There is darkness. And he has a horde of angels. He has a horde of demons. Angels are probably bound up. But in Ephesians 6, it says, put on the whole armor of God. That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. He's a liar from the beginning and a murderer, Jesus said. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Listen, when your family goes awry, when your kids go south, when the marriage goes bad, when the job is bad, when bad things happen, wake up, stand up, begin to pray through, begin to press in, begin to understand you don't have to put up with hell. I have a friend that says a lot of hell comes with heaven. There is an opposition kingdom, and it is opposed to everything you're going to do in your life. Satan hates us, and Jesus said he sees you as sheep for the slaughter. He told that serpent, you're going to consume dust. And man is made of what? Dust. Don't think wars. Horrific things that happen in this earth aren't the result of demonic powers. Was the church praying? Was the church pressing in? Was the church standing in the gap on behalf of the land, invoking the name of Jesus and the, and the power of his promises and all that God has told us to do? I don't believe anything happens earth side unless the saints begin to pray for it because we're his body earth side. This is our job earth side. His job is in the heavens that we can't see. Our job is in the earth where we can't see it. And we do know there's things happening. So there was an opposition party. Satan rebelled, took angels with him. But God has a plan because this thing's wrapping up, and hell was not created for man. Hell was created for Satan and his angels. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. The king says, go from me, you workers of iniquity. And he cast them into hell, which was made for Satan and his angels. God didn't make you for hell. He made you for heaven, made in his image. But you see, we can choose hell. We can choose independent, selfish desires. We can choose not to follow God. We can choose not to believe. It's our choice because God wants free will agents that will choose him because of what he is and what he's done, not because we have to. It's not a religion. It is our relationship with Jesus Christ. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, let me just show you hell. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Hell's real and it's eternal. There is no exit. There's no getting out. It's separation. It's the last death because if you travel on down that chapter in the book of Revelation, in Revelation 20, 13 through 15, it says, the sea gave up the dead who were in it. And death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Death and Hades are the last ones to go. You don't throw concepts into the lake of fire. You throw beans. I believe death and hell are probably beans. Like Lucifer, who is now Satan. There is an invisible world bigger than you can imagine. How do you describe the kingdom of heaven to people who are in, living in time and in finite minds? How do you describe what God is like? How do you describe his kingdom to people that can't even begin to imagine? Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things that God has for him. But in the New Testament, we have the mind of Christ. God now wants to reveal the mystery that's been hidden from the ages, that you and I have been deposited into the kingdom of God, that you and I are number two citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Number three, that you and I can now live and move and have our being in agape love. It's our nature, and it's the law that we live by. 
Number four, that you and I can live in the economic system and be successful. The very definition of being blessed is the power to succeed. God has blessed us. He's given us as his children the power to succeed. And we do that by faith. And the last thing, number five, we are to enforce the kingdom of God. That's why Jesus said, all power has been given to me. You go now in my name. Cast out devils, heal the sick, preach the gospel. The poor have the good news preached to them. Be the shining lights in this world. Be the city that I've set on a hill. Be the people of God that have stood up and allowed the Spirit of God to grow them up. That we've put aside childish things. That the epics of the flesh in this world no longer hold us captive. But we are now embraced and invigorated by the things that the king has to give us. Beloved, if you understand this kingdom and begin to grow in it and learn it and know the king, my lord, the king, the king, if the king has beckoned, if the king has said, if the king has commanded, then my knee is bowed, my heart is instantly submitted, and whatever the king wants, I will do for love of the king. See, God wants us to fall in love with the king. He wants us to fall in love with his son because his son is the exact image of God. He came to buy us back, redeem us. Oh, he did it through identification. He had to become the last Adam. If you go home and read 1 Corinthians 15, it'll teach you about the last Adam, that the first Adam was a life-giving man. He spawned us, but the last Adam is a life-giving spirit. And as we bear the image of the firstborn, we bear the image of the last Adam. And as he is, so are we on this earth. Let me tell you, the best is yet to come. I had so much more, but I'm done. This kingdom lies.